Sunday mornings must never become just a gathering of a crowd. Last week there was overflow in the Kingdom Connect room. There was overflow out in the foyer. And I know it was some, tough for some of you coming to first service last week during Family Anointing Week. But understand that no matter how many people, and we've seen some exponential growth in this house. I get it. But no matter how many people are here, if he's not here, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If the Spirit of God is not moving in this house, then nothing matters. If we're not going to be a Spirit-filled church, then we should shut the doors right now. Because it is the Spirit of God, the most active member of the Trinity, that is actively restoring marriages, this active, actively bringing prodigals back, actively healing sick bodies. And so we want to make sure that in this house that the governor has his way. We want to make sure in this house that the Spirit of God can do whatever it is that he wants to do. And so, Lord, we entertain nobody but you. We don't entertain religion. We don't entertain our past. We don't entertain style. We're not looking for the next song. We just want to be in your presence. Let deep calleth unto deep. As the deer panteth for the waters, so my soul longs for you. Oh, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and they are safe. Though they are those that shall slay me, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. For one can put a thousand to flight and two can put ten thousand to flight. Let the nation of God arise and declare, this is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day of the Lord. This is the day salvation comes to your house. This is the day salvation comes to your life. This is the day. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and bring this out here. Let's just declare over this house there's nobody better than him. Tell him that he's good this morning. No one better than you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For you are no one better than you. Nobody. No one better than you. There's nothing greater than him. Nothing. 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 So this morning, if you have a pressing need this morning, and what I mean by that is you, you need to see a physical, emotional healing in your body. You came into church this morning with an expectation and faith that God was going to meet you here. And you know that's you, if I'm talking to you. What I'd like for you to do right now, Pastor Missy's about to pray, but we're going to declare healing. I want you to step out in the aisle. If that's you, wave your hand and say, Pastor, I need a touch today. I need God to touch me. All we're going to do is pray. Step out in the aisle, and we're going to have somebody from our prayer team, somebody from our staff, just come meet you in the aisle, and going to lay hands and agree with you in prayer. Step out in the aisle. Pastor Missy's going to pray, and healing's going to flood this sanctuary. If you need healing in your body, or you need healing in your mind, or you came today with an expectation of faith for God to move, step out in your aisle. We're going to pray with you. Go ahead, babe. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit that there is nobody better, there is nobody greater, there is nobody. nobody higher, there is no one that deserves more glory, more praise today, Lord. So we just give it to you first, and we enter your courts with thanksgiving today. We enter your courts with grateful heart, knowing, Lord, that you are willing and able to heal your people. So Father, we declare healing right now to flow through this place from the front to the back, from every side, God. Every person that is hurting right now, I declare pain, you have to go in the name of Jesus. If you walked in here with pain, I declare that you just submit it to the Lord right now, that in he Jesus will heal name. you in the name of Jesus. In Jesus every strength name. that he took was for your healing. Every pain that he felt was for your freedom from pain. So we declare right now freedom from pain in the name of Jesus. If it's joint pain, I just declare you just move your joints right now that you will feel that freedom from pain when you wake up in the morning you will not be stiff your joints will not hurt they will have freedom they will have yes. everything they need to function i declare it gone back 
pain gone in the name of Jesus. Migraines gone in the name of Jesus. That pain in the back of your head that is keeping you up, I declare it gone in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for divine healing. I call out blood clots in the name of Jesus, that they will dry up, that they will be gone in the name of Jesus. When you go to your next doctor report, there will be no evidence of any blood clots. In Jesus' name, we declare it done and finished oh. by your strife. We are healed in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank we thank you, you Lord. Thank you. Torment, you have to go. Oh. Depression, you have to go. Fear, you have to go. You down in Jesus' name. We thank you that the Prince of Peace is in this place. in this house is tangible and transferable and everything that was prayed here in this house and the power and the anointing that we feel right in this very sanctuary you can feel in your house why don't you come into agreement with us this morning if you have a need just go ahead and type that in as you're watching we've got a prayer team that's standing by we want to pray with you but if you'll lift your hands I want to I just feel this pressing to pray specifically for those that are watching online and if you don't have a church home and you're in the Orlando area we'd love to see you here on one Sunday morning but they pray specifically for them that are online. There's somebody watching, then they have an expectation of faith today. I don't even sense that they're anywhere in this state, but that God's going to move and meet their need. Yes, in Father, Jesus we name. thank you, Jesus, that wherever they are, Lord, that your presence is so tangible to them, Father, that they feel you, that your Holy Spirit, a peace will fall in the name of Jesus. I declare peace over your mind. If there is mental torment, we declare it done and gone in the name of Jesus. I declare peace to fall, thank that the you. thoughts that you been thinking of, of death or even of suicide, I declare them broken in the name of Jesus, that you will begin to speak life over you when you wake up at night, that you will not declare death, but you will declare life yes, in Jesus' yes, name. So we break yes. down that curse in Jesus' name. We declare you healed from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Come on, does anybody love Jesus in this room? Are you ready for the word of God? Amen. Come here. Stand with me for a minute. If you, if you have your Bible, go to Judges chapter 6. We're going to go right into the message um, in the state of worship. But I'm, I'm Pastor Jeremy. This is Pastor and the First Lady. You get two names up in here. Missy. I got to put up with you, so I deserve two names. Uh, well, come on now. Look at you in your Top Gun outfit. Yeah. Got your jumpsuit on ready to go, hey, baby. We're kind of matching. Listen. It is an honor and a privilege to be pastors here of this church. We love you so very much. We welcome you to Kingdom Culture. If this is your first time with us, it is an honor to be here in church with you. You know, here at Kingdom Culture, we exist to help people passionately pursue a life of heaven on earth. That means in everything that we do, from our children right now, heaven on earth. In our kingdom groups, heaven on earth. In our serve teams, heaven on earth. In our pre-service meetings, heaven on earth. When you get a cup of coffee, we want you to experience heaven on earth because ain't nothing more hellish than a bad cup of coffee. <laughs> no, <laughs> but we want, that's our desire. And we see in the Bible that every time this happens in the New Testament, in Acts 17, 6, they said that these men turn the world upside down. And so you may be wondering, what is with the upside down crown? It is a reminder and a message to you that when you bring heaven into the earth, it'll turn the world upside down. And we're grateful to be here today. As a matter of fact, babe, talk to us a little bit about the 22nd, on August the 22nd, because we want to make sure that in our kingdom groups, that heaven on earth explodes. And I want to, hold on, hold on, I'm not done yet. I haven't passed it off yet. Hang on. <laughs> One thing I want to make very clear in this house is that you say, well, pastor, do you want to keep growing larger? Yes, we do. We want to reach more people, but we want to connect small. We don't ever want to lose the fact that this is a family church and you know, my family's watching online, but they're not here. This has always been our family. I was talking with Mama Mary Jo today. Donna, I know you were there in the home. There were 12 of us right here uh, on, on Hempel Cove 
uh, just nine years ago, just wanting the presence of God to show up. That's all we wanted. And that's still what we want today. But we want you to know that being connected really matters in a house that's growing like this one. So on August the 22nd, we've got an opportunity for you to play a part in that. That's right, on August 22nd at six o'clock, we have a vision night for our kingdom groups. So if you are interested in leading a group, this is a night for you, or if you're just interested in finding out more information about our kingdom groups, come out to the 22nd. We're gonna have childcare provided for you. We'll have some light refreshments, and of course, coffee as well. Just to be able to fellowship with you, you're gonna be sharing your heart, your vision behind groups, what it means, because we truly believe that we can experience heaven on earth within our groups. When we go outside the four walls, we are changed, we are transformed. There are so many stories about absolute miracles that have taken place within our groups. It's incredible. And when we change here corporately, we go out into our homes, when we uh, get changed together, then we change our cities, we change our workplace, our schools. Everywhere that you go, you know your authority and we need each other. We need we really to grow do. together. We need to get better together. And that what that is exactly what Kingdom Groups are about. So if you want to lead a group, if you want to take your next step in growing as a leader here at Kingdom Culture, come out on the 22nd and let us just share our heart and our vision behind our groups. Or again, if you just want to know more about it, get a little bit more information, come on out the 22nd. You know, I think there's few things in the kingdom that are more devastating to a believer than isolation. And so this is why it's imperative for us to be connected. And somebody said, what is heaven on earth as it relates to groups? It can be miracles, right? Somebody's arm could grow back right in a kingdom group. Somebody's eye could be restored right in a kingdom group. But heaven on earth could also be you have to go to the hospital at midnight and somebody in your group that has a spirit of God in them shows up into your valley there in the hospital and prays with you. That's That's heaven on earth as well. This is what happens inside of our groups and we thank you for being there on the 22nd. Now are you ready for the word of God? Love you. Love you. Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. I'm ready to preach this morning. If you're ready for God's word, shout yeah. Yeah. All right. Judges 6, please remain standing for the reading of God's word. I have been sitting in my private time on the life of Gideon for three weeks now. I have yet to make it out of Judges 6, 7, and 8. Matter of fact, and I mean every morning in my seek first time, I keep wanting to go forward because I'm, I'm, I'm competitive even in my read my Bible. Like I'm going to, no, I'm going to get five chapters today. I'm not going to do two chapters. And, um, but I keep over and over again back in Judges 6. Every now and then I'll get to Judges 7. But literally every morning, this morning again, back in Judges 6. And so God is wanting to speak something, I believe, not just to our house, but to our nation, to our generation, about the life of Gideon. Gideon, if we sum up this entire text, Gideon is a mighty warrior that is called out of a wine press of fear and disbelief. He is in the midst of fear, in the midst of disbelief, but despite all that, there's a warrior on the inside of him. And I want you to know today that no matter what you've been through, no matter what you've done, no matter how you feel today, baby, there's a kingdom warrior on the inside of you. That God has called you to Ephesians to put on your armor of God and go out and whoop devils. And I want to whoop some devils. How about you? Amen? All right, Judges chapter 6 and verse 1. <clears throat> Play it, pay attention closely to the words, especially if you see them underlined or in bold. Because if you read the Bible, it'll talk to you. Talk to you. Somebody that's a guest today said, what is that? Well, for nine, ten years now, we've been saying, if you read the Bible, it'll talk to you. Because listen, not just preachers should be the one talking to you about the Lord. You read his word, he'll talk to you. I'll take a little bit less than the monitors right now until they get me riled up. And then I'll take a little more. Judges 6, verse 1. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian for seven years. Now, this is a wash, rinse, repeat all through the book of Judges. All through the book of Judges, we see this, that the people of of Israel would do evil. God would raise up a judge. God would raise up a prophet. They would turn back in despair. Then that judge or that prophet would die, and they would go back into the same cycle again. This is where we are in Judges 6. The Bible said that the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves. Somebody say, for themselves. God didn't do this. They made for themselves the dens that are in mountains and caves and strongholds, and this is where they would live. Verse 3. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. 
they would encamp against them and they would devour the produce or devour the harvest of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. Imagine this, completely wiped out. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents and they would come like locusts in numbers. Both they and their camels could not be counted, so they laid waste to the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low. Somebody say low. Israel was brought very low because of Midian, and the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. Verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth, or the oak tree, at Orpha, which belonged to Joash the Aborazite. That's a lot of words right there. You know, the big thing about reading scripture when you're preaching is pretend, say them with confidence, even if they're wrong. <laughs> Let's just say the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth of the tree on the Oprah show. We'll just call it Oprah, which belonged to Joash the Aborazite. While his son Gideon, this is a key portion of this text, was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, For the Lord is with you. This doesn't make much sense. O mighty man of valor, Gideon's hiding in a wine press, and the Lord begins to call him mighty. <clears throat> and Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Have you ever asked that question? Why, Lord? Why is this happening? You're supposed to be on my side. I've been worshiping. I've been tithing. I've been trusting you. Why is this happening? And where are all the wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours. And doesn't even pay attention to what he's saying. Go in this might of yours and save Israel from Midian. Do not I send you. And he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. Sounds like Saul. And I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, but I will be with you. Oh, my goodness. As long as God is with me, as long as he is on my side, as long as he is standing there, I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. As long as I know God is on my side, my marriage can make it through anything. As long as I know God is on my side, I can come through every diagnosis of the enemy. I just need to know sometime, God, that you're on my side. I can go through a dark season if I know you're on my side. I can go through pressing times if I know you're on my side. Lord, today I just need to know that you got my back. Today I just need to know that you're with me today I need you to just comfort me and let me know that everything is gonna be all right and the Lord said go for am I not with you strike the Midianites as one man now Gideon is a warrior but is unbeknownst to him until one day God saw the warrior in the wine press and called him out today I want to preach you a message called there's a warrior in the wine press there's a warrior. Let's push your neighbor and say, neighbor, you're the warrior. Come out of the wine press. Today, living in fear ends. You hear me? Living in fear ends today. The spirit of fear is gone in the name of Jesus. Fear, you have to leave this place. So I don't know if I'm gripped with fear. You would be surprised after we get through today. Today, we are renouncing the spirit of fear, exposing it for what it is. Depression, anxiety that are all consequences of fear are leaving in the name of Jesus. You're going to sleep all through the night tonight in Jesus' name. I declare it over my own life that fear gone and let the warrior arise in the name of Jesus. Somebody say, Pastor, you ain't even started. We're radical. We're going to get more radical than this because the world doesn't need weak Christians. We need warrior Christians. We need Christians that will stand up and fight in the school systems. We need Christians that will stand up and fight in their jobs. We need Christians that will fight at hospitals. We need Christians that will stand up and declare the acceptable year of the Lord. I'm calling out the warriors today. Fear you got to leave in Jesus' name. Lord, I love you. Teach us your ways that we may know you and that we may find your favor. For there is indeed none that are like you. For who is like the Lord in all the earth? Lord, we've searched all over and found no one. 
no one but you. So today I pray that you would move magnificently across this place beyond anything we could ever imagine. Thank you for exceeding the expectations of glory as we stand in your presence today. Father, let this not be another service, but I thank you that when you show up, Lord, you call us up. So today I'm asking that every one of us, including me, the preacher, the pastor, that every one of us would be ministered to by this message and that we would leave change. I pray for those watching online today that their hearts would be transformed, Lord, by your glory and that we would leave here greater warriors for the kingdom of God. I thank you that in Winter Garden, the kingdom is expanding. That in all of Central Florida, the kingdom is expanding. In Jesus' name, and somebody shout amen. Amen. Hey, before you're seated, find two or three people that you've never shook their hand before. Shake their hand, high five them, slap them upside the head, and tell them they're a warrior. Just say, you're a warrior. I prophesy. You're a warrior. Amen. All right, y'all having too much fun. <clears throat> I want to take a look at three things in, here, in this text. I want to look at the cave. I want to look at the wine press. I want to look at the tree. The cave, the wine press, and the tree. Somebody say the cave, cave. the wine press, and the tree. Let's begin at the cave. The Bible said that the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves dens, that are in mountains, they made caves, and they made strongholds. Now, understand that Israel, according to the promise of Abraham, is a nation of vast superiority. Yet they are living an inferior life. Much like those of us that call us ourselves saved, we are children of the Almighty God, yet when we allow enemies to torment us relentlessly, we are living an inferior life. It is very often within the house of God that people go through the motions of religiosity but do not know their kingdom identity. Because if we knew who we were, we wouldn't put up with the stuff we put up with. And this is the cycle that Israel is in. Israel has a judge. They have a prophet. They realize their identity. They live for the Lord. Favor and blessing come after them. Then the one that judged or ruled over them would leave, and then they would go right back into what they were dealing with before. So they're a nation that has great potential of superiority, but they're living an inferior life, and their enemies are coming against them. Now, their enemies aren't just normal enemies, not like your third cousin, okay? Their enemies are vile, they're barbaric, they're relentless, yet here's what I love, God is using their enemies to expose their weakness and teach them. Every great warrior must overcome great weaknesses. I don't care who you are in this room, how strong you are, and how long you've been saved. As a warrior, you still have some weaknesses that God needs to work on. And sometimes God will use those that hate you the most to teach you your greatest lessons. Sometimes God will use those that have dogged you out and talked about you to teach you the greatest lessons because it was the pain that prepared you. It was the betrayal that matured your fellowship with the Holy Spirit. It was the wound that brought you back to worship. Your enemies were necessary because they humbled you and they drew you closer to God. Some of you need to start thanking God not just for your blessing, but thank God for your enemies because your enemies were used to teach you a lesson. They drew you to a place of worship like you've never worshipped before. I thank God for every wound. I thank God for every ounce of pain. You don't need to be mad at the person that caused it. Be thankful that God took what was meant for harm, Genesis, and turned it around for good. No, I'm seriously, oh, I've heard this in church before. Then start thanking God for your enemies and stop complaining about them. You're more mature now. You needed the opposition. You were too immature to go forward without it. It was the opposition that matured you into the believer that you are today. Now, this, this is where we are in this text. A nation is sowing. They are losing their harvest because go back to verse 1. Verse 1. 
The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them over in the hand of Midian. A nation is losing their harvest because they lost their worship. This reminds me so much of the modern westernized church today. We are losing a harvest of souls because we've lost entertaining his presence. We would rather often entertain people than entertain presence. So they are losing their harvest because they've lost worship. Last week I taught a little bit about this. I just want to dab on it just again. That in the Bible you've got John the Revelator that is perhaps one of the greatest men of revelation all throughout Scripture other than Christ who pinned down words and was trusted with words of things that have yet to even transpire. Thousands upon thousands. Who knows how many thousands of years would go by before the things that he was entrusted with will go by. Yet before he was ever John the Revelator, he was John the Beloved. He was the one that knew how to have relationship. And this is where we get in big frustration and problems is when we seek revelation without re relationship. Because if we seek revelation without relationship, we just get theory. And we get poor theology. For it is relationship that breeds revelation. You want wisdom on how to deal with this situation? Get on the carpet. You want to learn how to navigate this season? Lay on your face during worship and cry out to him. You need answers for God, from God for your business? Then start praising and thanking God and lifting up holy hands and praying before him because it is relationship that breeds revelation. So Israel is not just losing wheat, they're losing identity. Not just the revelation of a natural harvest, but a revelation of a kingdom harvest. Because it is inside worship when you begin to tell God who he is, that God starts telling you who you are. And it's very hard for you to know who you are if you're not spending time in the presence of Father. It is a father's job to release identity. And so when you are not in a state or a place of worship, if Sunday is the only time that you're in worship, then you will hear a, hear a preacher and you'll feel, oh, you ever feel the goosebumps in church? You know, the Holy Ghost goosebumps. And you feel like you can take on the world because in the presence of God, identity has been released. But then on Monday, you're depressed again. On Tuesday, you've got anxiety again. On Wednesday, you're acting crazy again. Why? Because outside of his presence, you don't know who you are. This is why David said, early shall I rise and seek your face because I need you to tell me who I am before the world gets a chance. Because baby, when you leave your house, the world's gonna try to tell you who you are. The world is gonna try to tell you you are less than, you are nobody, you should be afraid, but in Jesus' name, you are more than a conqueror. This is where Israel is. And instead of living in the promise, they're living in fear. And here's the thing about fear. Fear is a master of teaching you how to live with it as if it was normal. I mean normalcy. There are many in the body of Christ that are living underneath the oppression of the spirit of fear. Today I want to see people get delivered within my heart so deep. There are people within the body of Christ that are living under this spirit of fear and for too long you have accepted the torment that you are dealing with as normal. And as when you accept this as normal, you permit demons that you've been given the power to punish. You're permitting what you have the power to punish. Fear is a spirit that dominates our inner being and destroys our relationship with God and with people. And before you think that fear is just shaking, the spirit of fear is not, you've got a handout. Anybody got a handout when you came in? Did anybody get one? Okay, we're going to get to that at the end. There's, these are symptoms and characteristics of what a spirit of fear will bring in your life. Fear is not just shaking in your boots. Fear comes in and destroys, relate. it can come through insecurity, it can be shown up as pride, it can come in any way, but it comes in and it tries to destroy relationships. And it usually invites itself in the midst of failure, heartache, betrayal, or in this case, fear came upon the invitation of unrepented sins. I got one mm, on that. I said unrepented sins. 
Unrepented sins are invitations for demonic strongholds. I feel like I'm making the devil real mad this morning. That when we, I'm not, I mean, you can still come worship. You can come and dance and shout. Unrepented sins is a door for demonic activity and demonic strength in your life. For when you repent and get it under the blood, the devil can't come in. He has to pass over. He can't come in that which is under the blood. You say, that, you don't condemn me. I'm saying no. Conviction leads to repentance, which leads to freedom. You want freedom but unrepented sins. And I'm not even mad at you this morning. I'm trying to get you in a place of freedom. It's as simple as turning from your wicked ways and saying no to the world and yes to him. That is the first step in freedom. Fear will lodge itself in every relationship you got. It'll mess up your job. It'll mess up your marriage. It'll mess up your money. Mess up dreams. And here's what I want you to catch with this. The spirit of fear never comes alone. The story began with the Midianites bringing oppression to Israel. When it came time for harvest, the Bible said that the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the people of the east came. Because the spirit of fear is just an, an, another entrance for other demonic activity. Now, I'll tell you something fun. It's not in your nose. This should be just free. Amalekites, the spirit of fear brought the Amalekites. It was the ones that were named. The rest were the people of the east. Amalekites. Amalekites in the Hebrew means to lick it up. My daddy's watching this morning, and I did all that just to say this. When my daddy, my daddy is, is country. <laughs> country. It ain't even country. It's country. Okay. <laughs> The other day he was at the house and my wife cooked some good old pot roast for him. How many of you know about Sunday pot roast? Throw it in the slow cooker with the brown gravy, mashed potatoes, mac and cheese, green beans in the can. Don't give me none of them fresh green beans. I want the ones in the can. Throw a little fat back in there, some salt and pepper, some cornbread. You put the potatoes down first, then you crumble the cornbread, then the meat and gravy on. Okay, anyways. And so we got done. It was, it was a beautiful meal. It was a wonderful meal. And I kid you not, I've got video on my phone. I, I almost, almost put it on the screen behind me today. My dad would take that plate, and we caught him. I'm not even joking, Missy. Am I telling the truth? I mean, licking it as if it was normal. And put his plate down, and we said, did this just happen? He said, boy, what's wrong with you? You don't lick your plate? <laughs> no, man. I just go get another helping. <laughs> Anyways, it literally means, watch. He was, when he got done, he showed. It, it, it literally, I just put the plate up back up in the cabinet. It was clean. But what he did was he removed all trace of food ever being there. Fear brought the Amalekites to remove trace that the blessing of God had ever even touched Israel. This is what fear is coming to do in your life. This is why 1 Peter 5 says, Be alert and sober mind, for your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's looking to lick up your marriage. He's looking to lick up your children. Literally devour every sign of the blessing of God in your life. But there's a warrior in the wine press, and fear stops now. Now, the people of Israel... Bruce, watch this. The people of Israel are still year in and year out trying to thrive. Pastor Troy, they go into a cave. They come out to plant every single year. Year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, year six, year seven, and here comes Gideon. They are still planting. They are still striving. They are still working every year, and they are running back to caves, leaving their seed unprotected. 
All the work is there. All the striving is there. And when it came time to reap, the enemy would devour. There's no greater torment than being allowed to sow yet never reap. And this is what the spirit of fear will allow you to do. Is you can sow seed, but you can't sow in relationship. So you will come in and sow seed because, you know, I'm going to do the right thing here, but I'm going to run back to this cave of fear. And the enemy is still permitted to take your harvest because you've not renounced and cast out this spirit that's been tormenting some of you for generations upon generations upon generations. But today it must stop. This is where you say things like, I, I, I'm doing all I know to do, but it's still not working. I'm trying so hard, but it doesn't seem to work. I know what this feels like. I'm not preaching down at you. I'm preaching with you today because I know what it is to be under control of a spirit of fear. I know what it is to say, God, I did everything they did and it worked for them, but it has not worked for me. I know what it is to have the fear of man more than I had the fear of God. I know what it is to say things like, these failures don't seem to make sense. How about this one? I've got all this money, but I'm still not happy. All this money, but I'm still not happy. I've come to tell you today, church, that we are not people of the caves. We are people of the promise, and we must return to worship. We must return to worship. This is why we press so much during worship. It's what you're designed and created to do. We press because in that place, you can come out of the cave of obscurity and find out who you are. Listen, worship will tell you more about yourself than any preacher ever could. I don't care what church you go to. I don't care how lit it is. I don't care how buck wild it gets during the message. If you don't learn to worship, you will not know who you are. And when you don't know who you are, you will hurt those you love the most. Now let's get out of the cave and go to the wine press. The Bible says that Israel was brought very low because of Midian. Somebody say, get low. So before God could raise up a warrior, he had to humble a nation. And God, by his mercy, will leave you down if you stay in pride. God is humbling a nation. Hmm. Do I need to state the obvious? God is humbling a nation in order to raise up a warrior that will not take credit. Can I tell you what God is looking for, saints? He's looking for churches that don't want the glory. He's looking for serve team members that don't want credit for anything. He's looking for pastors that that won't be the next celebrity, but there will be prophetic mouthpieces for their city. God is looking for, God has humbled our nation because he's looking for the warriors in the wine press that will raise up and that will say, look, I don't need glory for this. I don't need credit for this. God, it don't need to be that Pastor Jeremy's got a mega church. It just needs to be that there's a church in Winter Garden that God is moving. I don't even know the preacher's name. I just know that I once was blind and now I see I once was lost and now I'm found and whatever you do you got to get there because until God knows you will defer the glory God will withhold the favor I could sit on that statement all day long you've been wondering why the favor of you've watched the favor of God rest on other families you've watched the favor of God rest on other men and rest on other women and you've been wondering where's the favor of God in my life until God knows he can trust you to defer the glory favor will not find you yeah we gonna break fear and pride all in the same Sunday Now, there are several obscure things about this text. We've got this picture of the wine press. There we go. This is similar. It probably would have been a little bit deeper than this and a little darker than this and a little bit like inside of a cistern. But you can see that this right here, as it's been excavated, this is an ancient biblical time wine press that probably set many, many, uh, many feet lower than what it is right now. 
It is inside of this wine press that is down. It is dark because this is where they would beat the grapes. They would crush the grapes in order to get the juice to come from the grapes. This is what a wine press looks like. This is where Gideon's at. Gideon is down. It would have been much darker than this. Remember, this is just recently excavated. And so he's down in a wine press with wheat. Now, a wheat threshing floor, a wheat belonged on a threshing floor. Show the threshing floor. The threshing floor was out in the open. The threshing floor looked something like this. It was the wheat, the grapes you would crush and you would beat them. The wheat or the harvest you would throw up into the air. And the chafe, the wind would come and take the chafe away or the weeds away and down would fall the harvest. So this is the threshing floor. Now, Gideon, go back to the next picture. Gideon has what belongs there and he has it down here. So what is meant to be threshed and sifted is now being crushed. Now remember, there is no harvest in the land at all. Every year, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the people of the east come, and they take all the harvest, right? Right? Yet somehow Gideon has been blessed with a little bit of wheat in the middle of the whole attack. I'm telling you, if you read this Bible, it will talk to you. Despite what was going on, God trusted Gideon with a little bit of weed. I want to tell you that no matter what happens in this nation, if God can trust you, you'll still have some wheat. You'll still have some bread. I know milk is $42 a gallon right now and eggs cost $5 a piece. I get it. But guess what? As a child of God, you don't have a spirit of poverty on you. And, I, and I'm not saying it won't get hard, but you're always going to have some wheat. I I know hell will come, high water will rain. I don't care what inflation is. I know as a child of God, I'll always have some wheat. And he takes what was meant to be out in the open down to a closed off place because he's afraid of two things. He's afraid of those that hate him coming to steal from him. And he's afraid of those that say they love him that are jealous because he's blessed and they're not. Because he's living inside of a climate that nobody else is blessed. So he's hiding a blessing for the fear of what the people would say. The truth is, church, not everybody can handle the fact that you're blessed. Have you ever felt like you had to hide your blessing? Because you're afraid of what people would think. You're afraid of what people would say, that you had to hide it sometime. This is where Gideon is. Not everybody can handle what you have because those that hate you, they want to steal it from you. And those that say they are close to you only love you if there's blessing equality. Meaning if you got the same blessing as them, then they will continue to love you. But the moment you get a little bit more than them, they start hating on you. They get mad at you. So Gideon is nervous that his enemies and the ones that say that they love him are going to come and steal what God has given him. So he's beating down a blessing that was meant to be sifted. He's underneath the crown in darkness, crushing what required the presence of wind in order for it to be revealed. You've got weed and wheat. Are you seeing this? Down trying to figure out what's the good stuff and what's the bad stuff. But if he had the presence of wind, he could throw it up and the wind would do the work. So Gideon is struggling removing that which is unnecessary from his life because there is no presence of wind. Now your Bible is very clear that wind in scripture is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, it calls him a mighty rushing wind. John 3 calls it the blowing of a wind. The spirit goes like the blowing of a wind. Without the wind, there was nothing to separate the unnecessary from Gideon's life. I want to tell you the spirit of fear robs you from the conviction of the wind. Nothing, there's nothing in your life. There's no relationship with the Holy Spirit. There's no fellowship with the Holy Spirit. So there's nothing to remove the negative voices from your life. There's nothing to remove the negative thoughts from your life. There's nothing to remove the negative imagery from your life. Fear will keep you connected to ungodly covenants as long as you let a spirit of fear stay in. Fear doesn't just come in and just make you shake. Fear's job is to infiltrate itself in your life to keep you connected to other ungodly covenants 
You would never guess that something like lust would come from a spirit of fear. You don't know warfare. You would never guess that something like depression would come from a spirit of fear. You would never guess that something like pride and insecurity in the same come from a spirit of fear being allowed into your home, being allowed into your life. Now Gideon is trying to get the blessing of wheat in the darkness of a wine press. You don't get blessing without the wind to blow it. Nothing will get you out of position like fear. Gideon is the right man. Gideon has the right harvest, but Gideon is in the wrong position. Are you hearing me? You are the right man to the right woman. This is the right harvest, but is your relationship in the right position? Is your fellowship in the right position? I said, Pastor, you preach on this intimacy and fellowship stuff a lot. I know and the Lord won't get me off of it because what we need is a church of strength that knows how to fellowship with the Holy Spirit because it's only the Holy Spirit that brings forth the purity of heart and it is only the purity of heart that will change a city, that will change a nation and we are not here to have denominational organized religion. We are here to see a city turned upside down and what we want more than anything is to see Winter Garden saved, set free, healed and delivered. It is, it is a mission of ours, our entire team. We don't want to just play church. We want to see people encounter God. And so thus Gideon, out of position. He's out of position. He's got a blessing, but he's out of position. And so thus Gideon now... Gideon runs down into the wine press because he's afraid and he starts saying things like, if God was real, why am I going through this? And there's some of you in this room that have said this very thing. You might have got drug here by your mama, your friend, your auntie. I don't know how you got here. But you're here saying, if God was real, then why is all this happening to me? Gideon said, Matter of fact, I'm not going to be on this this week, but in one text he calls the angel sir, and another text he calls the angel Lord. He says, sir, he said, I heard you about, I heard about the Red Sea from my great, 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 whoever the greats are. I heard about the Red Sea. I heard about you passing over, but this is not passing over me. Every year they come and do this to us. And then he says, I'm a nobody from a nobody tribe. As if he did not have any responsibility to fix the state of the nation. And it, I realized when I was reading the text that even from my own life that it's often easier to blame God than it is to take responsibility for our own actions. Because God did not make this decision. We did. God didn't do this to America. We did. I know, I know, I know it's not popular. That's all right. God didn't do that. You did. Okay? And that's all right because the blood redeems. But it's often easier to shift that blame because fear will have you shifting blame because the moment you recognize that it is at work in your life, its days are numbered. If you can blame the reason on something else, then it permits the spirit to continue to thrive in your life. But the moment you own that you've been tormented by this spirit and you stop looking it in the eye and you put it underneath your feet and let it know that it cannot stand and it is no match for your God until you say, no, I'm not going to be depressed. I'm not going to be anxious anymore. I'm not going to be worried. I'm not going to be in fear anymore. You are under my feet and you will not control me, my marriage, my family, my future, my money, my dreams for another day. In the name of Jesus, fear be gone. Go in Jesus' name. But here's what I love. God shows up, Gideon's out of position, this is the mercy of God. God shows up, and he finds a warrior down in a wine press. Now, we've gone through the cave, we've gone through the wine press, let's go to the tree, the Oprah show. The tree on the Oprah show. Now, the Bible said that the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth of the oak tree at o Oprah, and that belonged to Joash the Aberzite while his son Gideon is beating out this wheat in the wine press. 
Notice the position of this text as you read through the text. Notice the position. Gideon is beating out the weed in the wine press. He's down. The angel of the Lord shows up on the threshing floor level. He's up by a tree. You got to really read text when you read this. Gideon is down. The angel of the Lord is up at the tree on the threshing level. Because when God shows up, it's to call you up. And God shows up in this sense and says, listen, I'm not playing with your wine press game. He said, I'm not playing this little wine press, negative, always afraid, feeling sorry for yourself, blaming everybody game. So God shows up on top of the wine press and he calls Gideon up because God knew there was a warrior in the wine press. I don't care how negative you've been. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care about your insecurity and all that you've dealt with. You are a warrior that's being called out of a wine press today in the name of Jesus. There's more strength in you than you know. There's more boldness in you than you know. There's more word in you than you know. There's more power in you than you know. There's miracles at the laying on of those hands that you've got. There's breakthrough in your mouth if you will open your mouth and declare it. There's more on the inside of you than you know. I've come to speak to a body of believers this morning and remind you that you've been fearfully and wonderfully made by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And there's nothing that can stand in front of you except that which you let, for you are a son of God a daughter of God you're a joint heir with Christ Jesus and the angel shows up and said Gideon enough is enough it's time to get up out of the wine press what I love about this text that gives me such great hope Pastor Jose is that in the midst of darkness this is what gives me hope in the midst of all the darkness God was still searching the earth the Bible said in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. Here's the key word, heart. God didn't need a perfect man, a perfect woman. He just needed a willing heart. This is what God is looking for in the earth. Mama, this is what the Lord is looking for in our city. It's those that have a willing heart. Not those that are perfect. Old time religion used to always tell you you had to be perfect. And there was some merit to holiness, trust me. But it's not about perfection. It's about the willingness of a man's heart because man looks on the outside, but it is God that looks on the inside. And God is looking for a church and looking for a body that will have a willing, loving heart for the Lord and purity in heart to say, God, I'll do whatever it is you've called me to do because God chose Gideon because when the whole story is said and done, when it's all over and all of the victories, they come to Gideon and they say, Gideon, will you rule over us? And God knew that Gideon's answer would be this in Judges chapter 8 the men of Israel said rule over us and Gideon said look I'm not going to rule over you my kids ain't going to rule over you my grandkids ain't going to rule over you I'm not looking for some generational little lineage here of blessing he said that's not what I'm looking for I'm not looking for a throne I'm not looking for a platform he said here's what you're going to do he said the Lord will rule over you after all the victories God knew that Gideon would defer the glory to him. And for some time now, the enemy has been trying to intimidate and dominate warriors with fear. But the angel of the Lord looked at Gideon in the middle of his fear, and he said, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Can I tell you this morning, come on, that God is calling you out of the wine press? Can I tell you there's more in you than what you think? Can I tell you that you are sharper than you think you are? You're smarter than you think you are? You're wiser than you think you are? You're stronger than you think you are? There's more destiny on the inside of you than you realize. There is more that God, you haven't even scratched the surface yet of what God wants to do in your life. You've not even touched the brim of it. I'm talking to you right there. You've not even touched the brim of it. That you've just just taste it a little bit but God said I'm about to show you I'm about to show you Bruce I'm about to show you Jason I'm about to show you Donna you've not even scratched the surface of it there's more than what you know the dreams bigger the idea is greater the finances are even more it's bigger than you realize if you would just put it in his hands I don't even think we realize the fact that this building can't hold what God wants to do. We need more land. We need more property. We need a bigger building. We need to reach more young people. We need to do more outreach in our city. This whole city is going to know who Jesus is because of what God is doing in this house. 
There's more. There's more, but we've got to come out of the wine press. He stands there at the wine press. Gideon, you're strong. Gideon, you're a man of valor. Jessica, you're not a woman of weakness. You're a, you're a woman of strength. Wendy, you're a woman of strength. The angel looks over and says, no, I will not entertain that weakness. And calls Gideon back to the threshing floor. Calls him up out of the wine press. And the Lord sent me here to tell somebody that God is calling your dream back to the threshing floor. That God is calling your worship back to the threshing floor. That God is calling calling even books that you're supposed to write back up to the threshing floor. Matter of fact, God spoke to somebody that's watching online and, 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 and there's, there's tra- I just see transition and shifting and God said, you've been hiding in a wine press but I'm calling you up to the threshing floor. I speak boldness over you to obey the word of God. <laughs> I speak boldness over you to come. I know it's been, you're nervous. I know the many nights you're afraid they'll take it from you. I know there's those that will be jealous of you and that will hate you. But it's time for you to stop hiding who you are. You are a child of God. You are a joint heir. Come on, somebody. You are a child of a king. And it's time for you to take this thing out of the cave and get back out in the open. In the name of Jesus, calling your marriage back to the threshing floor. We got a marriage intensive here in a couple weeks. When is it? This Friday, Saturday. It's Friday and Saturday. And my prayer is right here, marriage intensive for everybody. Married, halfway married, want to tear up divorce papers, whatever it is you're in. But the Lord this weekend is going to call marriages back to the threshing floor. Back to the place of sifting. Back to the place of strength. God is calling us out of fear because there's a warrior in the wine press with every head bow and eye closed across this room. Now at this time, church, I want to reestablish culture. For those of you that already know that if you were to leave this earth today that you're going to heaven, now's not the time to leave. Now's the time to intercede. For at this moment, I want you to pray because I'm going to be giving an, an invitation for those who accept Jesus. And I want the saints to begin to pray. So if you're in this room and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, and you'll say, Pastor, I'm living my life in a wine press. I've never accepted Jesus as my Savior. And I don't even know totally what you preach today, but I feel something in my heart that's saying this is real. If that's you today, I want to pray with you. Or maybe you'll just say, Pastor, I've fallen off. I've made some mistakes. I need to reconnect my life with Jesus. And today I'm ready to get serious about my walk with the Lord. I want to pray for you as well. Because here's what I want to make sure of. I want to make sure that if you left here today and your number was called, I want to make sure that you would walk the streets of gold. I want to make sure that you're reunited with your family that accepted Jesus. I want to make sure that you get to see the throne of righteousness. So if that's you in this room and you'll say, Pastor, I need to get my life right, pray for me. We just raise your hand on three? Nobody's looking. One, two, three. Raise your hand. Raise your hand high. Thank you. Raise it high. Don't be ashamed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody continue to have your head bowed and prayed. If you raised your hand all over the room, will you just stand up so I can look at you and just pray with you? Please, you don't have to be embarrassed. Just stand up. If you've got your hand raised, stand up all over this room. You don't have to be ashamed. Go ahead and stand. This is a moment. This is a moment of transition. This is a moment of change. This church was built for this moment and for you. This opportunity. For you to walk away from everything that's been holding you. Once and for all. And live a life of freedom and peace. For there's no greater joy than being in the presence of God. And so if you're next to someone who's standing, I'd like to pray for them. Would you guys mind just coming to the altar up here if you're standing so that I can pray with you just right here? I don't want to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. I would just love to pray with you. Come on now, church. Can we give them a hand? Come on, can we give them a hand? Come on, will you stand to your feet and glorify God? 
Come on, you clap better than that for some of the sermon. The angels in heaven are rejoicing over this. Come on. Proud of you. Proud of you, sister. Proud of you all. Hey, baby, how are you doing? Bless you. This is it. This is the moment. This is it. Man of God, bless you. Man of God, woman of God. Man of God, woman of God, woman of God. Man of God, woman of God. Strength, victory, strength, security, victory, joy, peace over you. He said, Pastor, what are you doing? I feel like I'm doing what the angel did as he looked down into Gideon and he said, you're a man of valor. You're a man. I don't feel that way, but that's who you are. God's going to use you significantly. God's going to use you mightily. That you're going to come out from the world, be separate, come out from among them, but God's going to use you to testify of his glory. God's going to use you to break so many generational curses, it'll blow your mind. Literally blow your, you're going to break, God's going to show you things and you're going to break them and joy is going to flood your life. Peace is going to, not a I pray right here. Pray. What's your name, honey? Tasha? Yeah, worship's going to flood your life. Just begin to worship and thank Him. Things are going to be broken. Ideas and mindsets that aren't from God be broken in the name of Jesus. Broken in the name of Jesus. Everything that would keep you, everything that would hold you be broken in the name of Jesus. There's a great wave of transition I feel in your life specifically. Just I see a wave. Just a wave just running over you and totally enveloping you. Everything that you do. What's your name, sir? Mills. Mills? Am I LLS? Mills, okay. Just totally enveloping your life. Everything that you do. And it's going to happen swiftly. And it's going to happen quickly. And I know this is a little generic, but I'm, I'm just seeing some things in part. I just saw the wave. It's going to require audacious faith and a quick conversion in this moment that you're going to quickly, you're going to go from here to radical, quickly, quickly, radical faith, quickly. But you already have that seed on the inside of you. You already know who he is. And from this point, you're going to radically live for Jesus. And I believe in you. Man of God, I believe in you. So let's pray this prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. I love you. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, you died on the cross for my sins. And I confess with my mouth and I believe with my heart that you are my Savior. This is it. Say, this is it. I'm committing to you, Lord. I need your help. I've made mistakes. I'm in a hard time. But I know that through the blood, it has no more hold on me. I am free. Come on, say it. Say, I am free. I am free. I am free. I am free. I am not ashamed. I am not condemned. I am free. I am a child of God. And let the redeemed of the Lord say so now. Just praise Him. Come on, let, let Him say so. Now, I've got some prayer team people that I would love for you to pray with. I, they just want to take your request down, some things that we can be believing for you in life. I've got a book for you and a devotional to help you walk this. Pastor Troy, you're right here. If you guys don't mind, if you would walk with him, he's going to take you right over here to a Kingdom Connect room where I've got a gift for each one of you that will help you in your private walk with the Lord. Amen. Can we give him a hand one more time? Now, I've got just a moment left with you. But I'd like for you to take that hand out and please remain standing that I gave you. Pastor Jose is coming to get ready to close us out today. But if you didn't get it, you can wave your hand and an usher can bring it to you. We can also bring it up on the screen. But I want to talk to you about 10 symptoms that the spirit of fear is dominating your life. 10 symptoms. Are you ready? Self-protection is greater than kingdom advancement. Please hear me. 
This is what you came in here for. If self-protection is greater than kingdom advancement, if you find yourself trying to defend yourself more than you try to advance the kingdom. Next thing, obsessive, undisciplined thoughts. Obsessive and undisciplined thoughts. Lack of God dependency. You find yourself always striving with no rest. These are just symptoms here. The Holy Spirit showed me. Over-controlling. You know anybody like that? If you raised your hand, it was probably you. Gotcha. I've been there. I know what it is. I'll tell on myself. It's a spirit of fear. You feel like you have to control everything. Okay? If you seek comfort over obedience. Comfort over obedience. Spirit of fear. Spiritual vulnerability that leads to emotional instability. Okay? When you are vulnerable in your spirit, the spirit of fear, you're emotionally unstable. You're erratic. You're happy one minute, you hate the world the next minute. Spirit of fear. You feel rejected, thus you live as a victim. It's always a victim. Everybody's al always done you wrong, you're never wrong. Everybody's always done you wrong. Okay? If you seek man's affirmation more than God's, spirit of fear. You rationalize more than you pray and fast. Meaning that you are humanistic approach to everything. Everything's in your mind, your intellect. You rationalize, rationalize. I don't know if I do this, if I do this, if I do this. And you go through with ideas more than you pray and fast. Extreme insecurity, but also extreme arrogance. Both of them. Both of them are symptoms of spirit of fear. You hear God, but you're too indecisive to move with God. These are symptoms of a spirit of fear. You get excited about the prophetic word but you're too afraid to take a step. This is a spirit of fear. And now we're going to expose and destroy the spirit of fear by praying this prayer. It is this simple. It requires you though to go home and get out of the wine press and get on the threshing floor of relationship. I'm calling you to be intimate with Christ, intimate with the Holy Spirit. You ready? Let's pray this prayer together. Ready? You can just start when I start. Say one, two, three, go. Lord, reveal and expose any person, thing, or motive of my heart that the enemy may be using to gain access into my life. Lord, I repent for all sin in my life and I renounce every curse that I have spoken or accepted as truth. I am a child of God and I declare all lies be destroyed by the blood of Jesus. Come on now, somebody just give the Lord praise. One more thing. Say in Jesus' name, I renounce fear. I forbid it to bother me for another day. For as a child of God, I shall live in purity of heart, clarity of mind, through the Spirit of God, who will strengthen me to please only my Father. In the name of Jesus, I am free. Now somebody give the Lord praise. Amen.